So, okay. Let's share the screen and let's continue. So basically we now have the requirements, we have the, uh, the domain model and we have uh, the architecture and basically the, the way to structure our, our application. And we now need to make a more detailed design and to help us with this uh, we have the, the basic grasp patterns and uh, general responsibility assignment software patterns uh, is the, the, uh, the name of this. So, uh, in this uh, collection of things, I think I linked the slides here. We have some generic principles to, to get us started. And the idea between, between GRASP and uh, the idea of GRASP is to, to, uh, to do responsibility assignment. Let's see if we can find this slide here. I think we had a slide about this. Yeah. Responsibility driven design. Should be presentation instead. And the idea behind responsibility driven design is that we have two types of different responsibilities. We can have classes that are responsible for knowing something or classes that are and classes that are responsible for doing something. And basically knowing is well you need to add attributes to some classes because they need to know stuff and you need to add operations to classes because classes need to do stuff also. And the idea is to take the res take the, the the requirement and break it down into as small parts as possible and then figure out what kind of responsibility is this? and where should it go uh, using, for example, the domain model as an inspiration. Or if you have some design already present, well, then maybe you can use this design to find out. So, for example, well, we need to know a, 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 the name of, of each member in our system. What class should, be, be, uh, should know a member's name? Well, it's probably logical to put the name inside the member class because then it can be responsible for knowing its own name. You could put the names in uh, an array of strings somewhere else, of course. So in software we have a lot of different ways of solving things that are uh, better or worse. And we need to find the, the, good, the good ways and the grasp patterns are there to help us with this. And we talked a little bit uh, about all these patterns we have, so maybe we should just run through them. Uh, and the first one is the information expert. What class should get a specific responsibility of knowing or doing something? And we should try to assign responsibility to a class that has the information that we need. We saw this in, for example, in uh, in the blackjack game, we had this uh, function of uh, calculating the score of the, the uh, cards that each player had in its hand. So we need to know, okay, what information is needed? Well, we need the score of each player's hand. Is there something that knows this? Well, yes, the player class knows this. So then the responsibility of calculating the score of a hand should go into the player class. We could have put it in the dealer class also. We could have put it in some other class. But then we would probably have needed to, well, then I need to get the hand from the player and I need to get the cards from the hand and so on and so forth. So we get kind of like a chain of, of calls to different objects. And this is something you sometimes see in, in the code also that you can like access the uh, access an object and ask for well I need to get all these objects that you contain and then I do something on these objects maybe in a loop and then well then I'm done and this is typically uh, when you have missed the information expert 
uh, the, uh, the chances are that, well, this responsibility should go into the class that has all these objects to start with. I'll turn on the chat here also just to make sure I don't miss anything. And this is actually something that is called also the law of Demeter and don't talk to strangers. That is something that you should, should um, maybe have heard about. And this is, well, if you break the information expert pattern, you get this kind of like chaining of calls all the time. Sometimes it's hard to know what is actually needed and maybe uh, be, uh, be something that um, it's not that easy to find out. And you kind of like find out when you code that, oh, we need this part of information also that messes up your design. And then it's often better to take a step back and, and take a look at the, the, the need of information again and maybe assign it to, to another type, uh, this responsibility. Because forcing the responsibility into the design that you have decided when you did not know as much is probably not a good idea. And you can also have other kind of forces that, that says, well, yes, we have the calculation of the, uh, the uh, area of the circle and we have the draw function and they both use the radius and we need the radius to draw the, the circle. So by information expert, we should put the draw function in the, the circle class. But at the same time, our architecture says, well, you can't mix user interface with, with uh, domain and business rules, so they should be separated. So you also have this, this type of uh, forces to think about when, when you apply the information expert. Creator uh, is about creating objects. Uh, who should create objects? Creation of objects is something that is common in, in object-oriented systems because the objects are the stuff that runs. Uh, when the system runs, objects are created and, and executed and send messages to each other. So we have some rules for this here. And uh, maybe the, the second one is, is a little bit interesting because if the B object has information needed to create A objects well, we should assign the responsibility to create objects of type A to class B. And this is the information expert, but for creation of objects. For example, we let the, the, uh, the deck create all the cards. And this was because, well, the deck class contains all the cards. So the first rule applied here. And we also could see, well, the deck has the information needed to create all these cards because the deck knows what cards it, it had already put in itself, so to speak, because we did not want to create duplicates. Controller. Uh, this is about handling system events, and system events are typically big things that happen in, in the system. Think about this as well. The user has uh, filled in a form of information, and now he wants to continue the processing of, of this form in some way. So it is not the user has filled in a checkbox or a or a uh, text box. It's typically it's something bigger. In our small examples, system events in in Blackjack were typically well. I want to start a new game. I would like to uh, get a new card. I would like to uh, stand. So these are system events in our, in our application. And typically, they are connected to a scenario in the, uh, in the requirements. So play game is probably a, a use case in, in the requirements, if you use use cases for, for this. And uh, hit and stand are probably quite described in, in the requirements, also in the rules. So look for these big events that, that kind of like drive the system forward. And then we should, could, could try to so assign this responsibility to a system, uh, to a class that represents the system as a whole, some kind of facade controller. And you now know what the facade is. Uh, we could assign it to a system that represents a role in the system. This is what we did. We, I think we added a player in, uh, in the controller. 
package. And, uh, or we could opt to, uh, to name it as a use case, for example, play game. Or we could divide it even further into a scenario or a session. So we have this mapping of, of uh, the idea of mapping a requirement to a class in, in, the, in the controller. And this is nice because this means that we, well, in, in a case when, when a bug, bug crops up, we could, well, what kind of a user was this? What kind of operation did it try to, to do? And we can find this in, in the design and in the implementation. And this is uh, quite nice. Or we could use an input device for, for, uh, to represent the controller also. Uh, some, some more requirements. And we have two principles of, of uh, evaluating actually our designs because, well, maybe we have, have two ways of designing the same thing, solving the same responsibility. But uh, which one should we choose? So then, then we could add, could, could look at the number of couplings between, between the types we have and the type of coupling we also, that we also have. So, and we should, should opt for the alternative that offers the lowest amount of, of uh, coupling of dependencies. And if we're looking for reuse, well, we should, uh, if we have a class that, that this is something that we would like to reuse, well, we should look at what kind of outbound dependencies does this class get in, in design A versus design B? And we should select the one that has the least amount of outbound dependencies. Because if we take a class and we would like to reuse it, everything that it is connected to will need to come along or will need to be removed. So having outbound dependencies to things is something that uh, makes reuse harder. Typically in our uh, Blackjack game, the card class has no outbound dependencies, except for to its internal enumerations for color and value. And this card class is something that should be quite easy to reuse. And Thinking about it, well, cards are quite generic. They are used in reality in many types of games. So uh, this is something that you should could use as an evaluation criteria. If you are worried about change impact, that is that a class will need to change if something else changes, you could look at inbound dependencies. Because chances are that if uh, the, this uh, a change will affect the other class also. And something to watch out for are always hidden dependencies. That is that, well, we are dependent on something, but, but we can't really clearly see it. For example, the user interface in the dice game is probably dependent on the number of dices. This is not something that you can see in, in, in a class diagram, or maybe not even easily in the code. But if you add another dice, chances are that the user interface will break down. Because, well, you need to add animations and checkboxes and buttons or whatnot for this uh, new type of, of dice also. So watch out for these hidden dependencies. Of Hmm? Typically, a hidden dependency in code is uh, in the form of, uh, of uh, data that is needed to be matched. For example, I think we had this in, in, in kind of like the first version of the dice game. In, in between the view and the controller, the, uh, the view sends a, a character back to, to, the, uh, to the controller. So we have a dependency between what the view writes in its menu. You should press button A to do this or B to do this. And in the controller, you have a switch where you switch on character A and B. So when you translate the user interface to another language and would like to use other characters as, as uh, in the menu, 
Well, you need to remember to change these characters in the controller also. The controller will compile, compile fine, but it won't work. Because you press A and A is not mapped to the command you would like to do uh, anymore. This is one form of hidden dependency. Hidden dependencies are, are, are things that, well, the system compiles, but when you use it, it doesn't work anymore because you have forgotten to make a change in one or more places. And in the case of, of, of this, it is, could be better to use an enumeration with the commands and let this choice of character in the menu be encapsulated inside the view class. You could also solve it by, for example, uh, calling different functions in, in the view from the controller, depending on what the user would like to do. But the idea is that, well, if we change something, we should need to change this in one spot and not need to remember to change things all over. And this is also where we would like to use the compiler, because if we have a, a, a visible dependency, the compiler will complain. For example, well, I added a command in my menu for this new requirement, and or change or change it so so the uh, uh, compiler will complain that well this is not called this anymore this enumeration constant does not exist so try to use the idea is to try to use the compiler at first then to get some kind of a runtime error then to use tests and finally resort to documentation and need to remember things manually. So watch out for these hidden dependencies. They can be can be quite tricky and, and sometimes they, they are not that clear as a, a constant or a, 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 some kind of a string duplication. Well, a string is needed here and there. In web-based systems they are really, really string driven. You have a, a uh, a, a CSS class, for example, in your HTML. You use this in your JavaScripts, and you use this in your uh, style sheets. And if you would like to change it, well, search and replace. And maybe you even accidentally use it in the wrong place because, well, you can't find good names for everything, so you can like take a generic name and you use it, and you happen to use it once more, and things start to behave really, really uh, strangely. So this is something to watch out for. And if you need to document hidden dependency, you, dependencies, you should, of course, add them to your class diagrams also. If you, for some reason, well, we have this hidden dependency, we cannot remove it easily, add it to your class diagrams and describe it, because it is much, much better to have it documented than to just leave it. So if you have an ID or something like that present, add it to your class diagrams and document it. The other uh, evaluative principle we, we, we looked at was high cohesion, and this we talked about in the last lecture also. And, and basically, we should assign responsibility so that the class is responsible for one thing. So we would like to have a group of related functions that work on the same attributes. And, and we talked about this when, when we actually calculated some, some kind of a metric for, for this. And, and we counted uh, attributes and the, the number of functions that they were used in and, and things like that. Yeah? Cohesion är nog uh, sammanhängighet, eller samarbete. Uh, så det, det handlar ju om att ja, men de ska hålla ihop de här, de här funktionerna. De, de ska hålla ihop och jobba mot samma attribut. Uh, so you got a little bit of Swedish translation there. Uh, so, uh, we could look at this principle also, and we can make this calculation, and if we are really lucky, we have a tool that, that provides this to us. And 
we should should uh, opt for a design that that offers higher cohesion. And and, and both these two principles they kind of like work together. If you have good cohesion, you probably have a low amount of coupling also. And if we do this monster class that does everything, well, you probably have a lot of couplings from it also. So if things go bad, they are often bad in both respects. If they are good, they are often good in both respects. At the same time, it is important for you to, to, uh, to pick your battles here. You can't you probably can't have uh, every class really, really nice, but you need to focus on, on certain parts of your application. And those parts can, example, for example, be things that you would like to reuse, or things that are really, really complicated and hard to understand. So these need to be really good uh, from a design perspective also, so that you can understand and maintain them. Uh, you could have... Um, could have parts that, well, these parts are likely to change a lot. So maybe we should design these parts really, really well so that we can facilitate change in different ways. So the idea is not to make everything uh, super duper, but rather to focus on the important parts in your application. And sometimes you have these ugly classes that you kind of like need to sacrifice. We could maybe see this in the uh, the facade class in uh, in the uh, the blackjack game, we added the facade class because well, it made the controller a little bit more focused. But the facade class itself, well, that was kind of like highly coupled to the player and the dealer and, and stuff like that. So it it kind of like became a a the um, the uh, sacrificial lamp, so to speak. So we added this, but, and we, we saw that it, well, this will probably be a little bit messy, but this other part, the controller, will be better, and we will get a looser coupling between the, the uh, user interface and the model. And this is something that we would like to have. So, well, you need to give and take. Polymorphism is about selection based on type. You have some kind of behavior that yet varies based on type, and well, you could add a lot of if statements, but you should probably use polymorphic operations instead. So you should avoid extra states, type information, reflection, uh, runtime types, systems, and stuff like that, and try to use uh, the abilities that we do have. And for example, the strategy pattern builds on polymorphism to, to work. And we would like to vary the behavior in the dealer uh, based on what kind of a dealer he was. Was he an American dealer or a European dealer? And we could have added if statements, but we choose to make it using a polymorphic operation instead. Pure fabrication. This is probably the easiest pattern because it says that, well, basically, if you can't find a good solution, you can make something up. And this is because we are now in, in software land, and this is where we are masters. So feel free to make things up if it makes your world a better place. Uh, so you can do what you want, of course. And many of the patterns that we have discussed, for example, observer and composite and stuff like that. Well, they make things up. You don't find the observer in, in the real world. You don't find the facade, maybe, in, on a building. But, but th this is something that we make up to, to offer the de uh, design that we want. So we are not strictly bound to the domain model and said, well, you need to make it like this. The domain model is the inspiration and the coupling to the real world from the from the design so we should definitely use the domain model and be inspired by it both in database design and in domain layer design but we are not strictly bound to use it in in every case and we can add things and we can make things up indirection how can direct coupling between classes be avoided 
Uh, and here again, we use the facade pattern as an example. Well, we did not want to couple the, the, uh, our controller class to the player and to the dealer. So we put in a middleman to handle this. We put in a facade. And this is something that you find often in, in software system. Some, some object or some class that, that uh, acts as an intermediate to, to synchronize or mediate between other classes. And this is something that is often a, something that we just make up to avoid this direct coupling. Protected variations is about finding interfaces uh, and interfaces in the broadest sense and try to encapsulate uh, these for, for um, things that, that vary. And again, pick your battles. You can't have everything protected. And this is something also that we talked about in the, this open closed principle that said that, well, we don't want to modify the code, but we would like to be able to extend it. And, well, you can't probably find every possible way to extend something because that is impossible. So you need to kind of like think about likely uh, extension points, uh, but otherwise try to, to encapsulate and close off the system. And, and um, try to um, to make it um, so that you can can add stuff without the need to change the actual code. And we can have, for example, polymorphic operations to do this in object-oriented systems. But you can probably not add it for each and everything that you can can uh, think about. So I think that was the grasp of patterns. Questions? Should we continue with the patterns or should we take uh, a, a more modeling example? You have examples uh, from last year uh, in the modeling department. Should we continue with the Gang of Four patterns? Yes, yes, okay, let's do so. This is not the right slides. This is not the right lecture. So basically, building upon the principles of, of the grasp patterns, we have the gang of four design patterns. And these often use principles as polymorphism, protected variations, uh, indirection, to, to create uh, designs for common, common problems. And we have this book that we can, can take a look at that, that contains a lot of different patterns. And we will just be looking at a few of them uh, in, this, in this course. Uh, and also in the Applying UML and Patterns book, he has a few of the, these uh, described. So basically, we have creational patterns uh, where we will look at abstract factory, factory method, and uh, singleton. And we will take a look at today at abstract factory, I think. Factory method and singleton are discussed. This is one is discussed in the solution for workshop two, actually. So you can take a look at it um, there. And we have structural patterns. And these creational patterns are, of course, about creating objects. So if creator can't help us, the grasp pattern, we can take a look at these, these patterns. And we have structural patterns that are about how to uh, structure classes and compose objects. And well, we can take a look at the composite and facade here. And we also have these behavior patterns. And this was maybe the start. Uh, 
where we started actually using the observer pattern uh, uh, really early in the course to, to uh, facilitate the uh, sending a message from our model to our uh, user interface in some way. But also strategy has been, been used uh, throughout. And we also had an example with visitor. Template method, I think, was briefly mentioned somewhere. So we had this rule variation, uh, and we saw that, well, we could use the polymorphic operations, but as the number of combinations of, of uh, rule variations grew, the, uh, the use of, of uh, inheritance here was not really a good choice. Because, well, if we have three rule variation, three rules with four variations, we need to make 81 subclasses. And, well, that's not maybe that nice. So we use the strategy pattern here to encapsulate the, the rule and uh, made the specific implementations interchangeable. And basically, we had our dealer that was the client. And we had our start new game strategy as the interface. And we had some operation here. I don't remember its name. But basically, it needed a two players and a, a deck of cards to be able to fulfill the responsibility of actually performing the algorithm of dealing cards to the dealer and the player in different ways. And we had the American way of starting things and the European way of starting things. And uh, this means that, well, we can plug different rules into the client here, into the dealer, and we can make up new rules for this, this game. And this also means that, well, developer A can work on this algorithm, developer B can work on this, and developer C can work on another algorithm. And well, basically, if we have a good and stable interface, things will just work. And we have this factory uh, pattern where we have abstract factory, factory, and factory method. And basically, it's about, well, if creator isn't a good choice, maybe a creation of stuff is, is something that needs a lot of couplings to other things. And we would not like to, to, uh, to couple the, the deck to a uh, file reading class to read the configuration of the, the deck, the, the cards that we should use. Well, then maybe we should, should make something up here. We should make a pure fabrication and create some kind of factory object to load this card configuration file and then create the cards and put them in the deck. So this is the basic idea of the factory, that we should assign the responsibility to an operation in a possibly new class, and we call this class a factory. So card factory could have been uh, a suitable name for this factory. And we also have this abstract factory pattern that is about creating uh, families of objects for different, uh, for different uh, in, in different ways, where, where a family of objects kind of like are related to each other. You could imagine having a, a, a family of uh, user interface elements, buttons, checkboxes, text boxes, but they are implemented differently in different uh, user interface uh, systems. <coughs> and the abstract factory can make sure that, well, I would like to create a button. And depending on what factory is used, you get a certain type of uh, button. So you could get a direct X button, or an OpenGL button, or uh, some other kind of button, VPF button, or whatnot. Uh, but you can, from the outside, you, you just know that, well, I get a button. And depending on the factory, well, you can create families of objects of these GUI elements, and, and they all will be created for OpenGL or DirectX or Windows Foundation presentation or whatever GUI library you are using. And in factory method, you use, simply use a polymorphic operation to create objects. This is like the template method for creation. So in your class, you decide, well, I need to create stuff. But depending on what type of class I am, different objects are to be created. Then you add an operation, make it polymorphic create x object. And in different 
subclasses, you create different types of X objects. Abstract factory looks something like this. Uh, so you have a, a the uh, interface for the different products. You have the concrete instances of, of the products that fulfill the interfaces. And you have the factory that can create type objects of type A and object of type B, and they are returned as these two. And you have the concrete factory that, well, this factory A here, he, he uh, creates this type of B product, and he creates this type of A product. And if this happens to be the object that the client is using, well, then he will get this object and this object when he tries to create uh, create uh, objects of these uh, of type A and B. If it's the other type of factory, he will get the the this product or that product. Facade pattern. Well, we have already talked about this. Uh, we would like to design a good-looking single point of contact to a subsystem, a facade. So uh, the facade itself may be ugly on the inside, but it should show a good-looking uh, interface to the outside. And these interfaces are not always easy to, to design, uh, I should say. So making, making good facades are, uh, is hard to do without knowing a good deal about the needs of, of clients and also how the actual subsystem works. Time is running out. Composite was an interesting uh, pattern. It was about treating a composite, many components, as a single component. So the client does not know really if it's just one component here or if it's many. And we, I think we did the shape example here, where we could have an area calculation of, of a composite shape. So we could, uh, could add, uh, add a rectangle or a circle, calculate the, the areas for these. But we could also have a more composite shape that, that was made up out of many rectangles and or many circles. We also saw that we could easily make a mistake here by adding the composite object to itself and get an infinite recursion. That was kind of fun. And finally, we had the visitor pattern here about adding functionality dynamically to a class hierarchy. So we kind of like would like to add functionality to a, a, a hierarchy of classes. So we have a base class with subclasses and or an interface with the realizations. And we would like to add some functionality in this. The, the, uh, the standard way of doing this is, well, we add an operation in the interface, and then we implement this differently in, in each of the subclasses. But for some reason, we don't want to do this. This could be, for example, for, from an architectural point of view. We don't want to add this type of functionality into the classes, because it would make them more coupled or, and less cohesive. And it could also be so that, well, we don't have access to the interface. We can't change it for some reason. Maybe it's part of a framework, and well, well, we can't change that. So we need to add functionality in some other way. And the idea, or we would like to, to uh, design a framework that supports adding dynamic functionality, because we cannot, we cannot figure out all the, uh, the possible uses of our class hierarchy. This is something that users of our framework would like to do. So. Uh, the idea here is then to, to uh, create an, a new visitor interface where every class in the class hierarchy gets an operation of itself. And the uh, interface gets uh, augmented with an accept operation that takes a visitor object. And we then can, can create a concrete visitor to perform our operation and plug it into our uh, our root object, and well, it will uh, call accept on itself, and then it in turn will call visit element B if it's uh, that type of object. And it should be visit element A here. I hope to remember to change that. 
And basically what we did here was, well, we added this, uh, this way of actually printing what type of, type of um, uh, shape we have in our hierarchy. So I think this is all we have time for today. And basically I think also this is maybe what is, uh, this course was about. The last lecture about the object-oriented design principles, well, we had this, this last week, so it's not that, that old to you. Any questions? Nothing? All right. Uh, remember to try out the uh, exam system today. It opens up at 2 o'clock. Uh, please try it out. It's always good to, uh, to uh, take it out for a test drive. And remember, the questions are not from, from this course, but from another course. So uh, don't stress if you don't recognize them. And also, they are in Swedish. So. Uh, Anyway, I think the lecturing part of this course has run along really, really well this year. I think uh, the schedule has been good and nothing unforeseen has actually happened. So um, this is always something that is nice. And I also think that the lectures has been in good sync with the actual workshops. So I will try to do it possibly like this next year also. I don't know if it has been rough for you to have like two weeks of with three lectures in, in each week, or if it has been an advantage. I, I personally think that it, has, it worked better than last year, at least. Uh, and we have like 11 lectures, and that is, that is uh, the same as last year, I think. Uh, so we have had a, a good pace, and uh, this has worked out well. I also think that the workshops have have worked out. Uh, you have one workshop left, of course, and hand in of the second workshop today. Uh, as I said, the second workshop is, well, that's probably the biggest one. So the last one is not as, as uh, big in terms of you coding a lot. Uh, rather, you get, uh, get uh, more, uh, more ideas of refactoring and, and uh, patterns in this in this workshop. So uh, there, of course, will be a session with the um, workshop uh, next week with tutoring. And please do start with workshop number three so that you can, can hand it in uh, according to the deadlines as soon as possible. And uh, we will have questions and answers tomorrow and on Friday. So there won't be anything in the classroom but rather on connect. So if you have any questions, please drop by and ask them. I think that's it for me then. See you uh, later. Bye.